So when we think about a career progression in tech, we tend to think about junior to senior to lead to architect to principal. And I think that misses the point to some degree because there is an axis of technical proficiency that's missing from that. And I think that's most easily described as going from a framework consumer to a framework creator. So you start off using something like Spring or React or Vue, depending on the paradigm within which we are working, and you are uh, moving up that technology proficiency chain from where you're actually just consuming that framework to where you're ending up creating a framework that is used by tens, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of other engineers, and they become your consumers. So to get there, you're, you have to build up your technology, your skill set, right? And you start off with basic proficiency in your language of choice, and be it you know, learning about all the ways of doing conditionals and looping and creating functions and methods and classes and instantiating objects and all that. Then you work up to data structures and algorithms and finally into design patterns. And design patterns are ways of expressing solid architectures that are reusable and extensible and that are industry standards. So in this video, we're going to look at five different design patterns from this, the original OG book, the Gang of Four Design Patterns book. It is in C++, but the concepts are usable and understandable in any language and also in any environment. So on the browser, in Android or iOS, on the server, wherever you're going to be, design patterns are going to help you go from a framework consumer to a framework creator. All right, let's start off with our first one and let's see how fast you can identify it. So you have a database driver that you're connecting to. You want to get a list of all of your customers. So you make that query and you get back a list of all the objects, which are customer objects. So in this case, you've got the customer object or the customer class of which you can have many, and then the database driver of which there can only be one. And you might've guessed it, that's the singleton pattern as specified in here. And it means that for that given class, there can only be one instance. And that's really good for doing things like a database driver, or uh, the list of all the configuration settings for your application, or if you're over on the client, maybe the data store, the current state of the app, that's stored in a singleton. The pro is that you can go and get to that data anytime that you want. All you have to do is just, you know, get the singleton and away you go. The con in your evolution to framework creator is you might jump on the singleton bandwagon too early. And once you've gone there, once you've said that there can be only one and you've added that constraint, it's really hard to back that out. It means that instead of everybody being able to just go and access it directly, now you've got to pipe down whatever the current, well, database driver in this case is an example, you got to pipe that down to whomever the consumers are. So as with all of these design patterns, you got to make sure that you're using it the right way and at the right time. Otherwise, you're going to get stung. The second design pattern we're going to look at is the facade pattern. And a lot of these design patterns are actually modeled on real world building style architecture. And this is no different. So a facade in the real world is the front of a building and it hides all of the mechanics of the building inside, the insulation, the rooms, the plumbing, the, infra the, the electricity and the basement and all that stuff that you don't wanna see is hidden behind this nice facade. It's got a door and some windows and all of that. It looks really pretty, got great curb appeal. And so as a framework creator, uh, this gives you, the facade pattern gives you the ability to put a nice external veneer on your app. Now, the example that they use in the book is a compiler. So a compiler has got all kinds of cool stuff inside. It's got a parser, it's got a lexical analyzer, it's got a tokenizer, it's got all kinds of fun stuff in there. But from a consumer standpoint, when you as a framework creator are thinking about your customer and having empathy for what they want to do in their priorities, you're saying to yourself, oh, maybe I don't want to give them access to all the internals there. Maybe I just want to give them a nice compiler facade where they give me something, I compile it, and I return it, and away you go. And I hide all those internals. So that's the big pro. 
it gives you and your consumer a nice interface. And if you allow them, then if they want to, they can go around that interface and go and get to the interior if, if you so choose. Now, the downside is you can have a leaky paradigm there. You can have a leaky abstraction. In other words, that you've oversimplified. That compiler interface is so simple that it's not really usable and not really valuable, and that can be a problem. Another problem is over-verticalization, meaning that you've created a facade that's so specific to a single use case that it's no longer generalized enough to be generally useful. So those are things to watch out for when you're using a facade pattern. So the next design pattern we're going to look at is the bridge pattern. I call it the adapter pattern, but they've got a different definition in the book for the adapter pattern. But let me use a visual example on this one. So here is a Sony mirrorless camera, just like the one I'm shooting on right now. And it actually is two pieces, right? So you've got the camera body and then you've got the interchangeable lens. And that allows this camera body to be multi-purpose, right? In this case, this is a wide angle lens, good for giving nice big context like this. This is a 55 millimeter lens, which is a lot better for doing kind of headshots and portraiture. And I use that when I'm doing zoom calls. So uh, why that's important in this context is from the software perspective, you're doing a similar sort of thing. You're creating an API where in this case, the API is this like connector here in software world. That would be an interface, right? And so now on the server side, you might have that database driver that we talked about before. You'd have an abstract interface for your database driver. And then you'd have concrete implementations for, say, Mongo or DynamoDB or whatever else you're going to get into. And then that's a great thing about this pattern is it allows you to create a product that's usable by a wide variety of customers and a wide variety of situations. Similar sort of thing on the client side. You could do an analytics abstract interface and then have concrete implementations to go to something like Adobe's Omniture or Segment or your own in-house homebrew, whatever you want. And that can work both on the website or on mobile. The problem is, the, the big con on this one, is when you use it too much, right? So in this case, there's only one extension point to this camera and it's this interchangeable lens. Sony didn't go and go create modules for this little dial here or the eyepiece, right? They used the, the, that pattern judiciously. So you should do the same when it comes to your software. Don't overuse this pattern. And the great thing about it is you can also bring it in later. And that's what you can do with a lot of these design patterns. You don't have to start out of the box by creating the world's most modular system, get something working. And then when you see the points where you need modularity and this bridge pattern, then go bring those in. The fourth pattern we're going to look at is the strategy pattern, and it's one of my personal favorites. So let's take a scenario. You've got this piece of furball code that's going to go and find a bunch of customers, filter through them, and then send out email and text notifications to them. And nobody likes working on this piece of code since it's doing multiple things and it's just a hairball. You can use the strategy pattern to significantly clean this up. And how you do that is you go and take the mechanics of getting access to the customer records, sending out the text and emails, and then creating that as an infrastructure layer, and then factoring out the filtering of those customers into one strategy, which is the strategy that helps you go find the target customers you want, and then the notification strategy as a different strategy, and that helps you decide when and where and how you want to contact those customers. So that strategy pattern cleans up and makes it very easy to use. And then you can actually use that library or that system in a whole bunch of different scenarios and it becomes much less of a hairball. So one thing you got to look out for on this is always make sure that you have decent default strategies. So in the case of our refactoring, we go and take the existing logic around the customer filtering and the customer send outs and turn those into the default strategies. And then later on, people can extend them. Otherwise, you get a system where by default, you're asked to do a lot up front and no customer wants to do that. I want to go and take your library off the shelf, just use it right away. And then if it doesn't match what I want to do, look and see what the extension points are that I can tap into to modify the behavior to where I want it. And the strategy pattern makes a great way to do that.
The fifth pattern we're going to look at is my favorite of all of the patterns, and it's the observer pattern, or what we've come to know now as PubSub, because it's everywhere. It's on the server, as message queues between applications, it's on the client, as eventing systems. PubSub is everywhere, and there's a good reason for that, because it allows for loose coupling between the publisher that's creating events and the subscriber or subscribers that are listening for those events. And you can use it anywhere. Now, the con on this particular pattern is that uh, you can go overboard with it. If everything is communicating by events, then you can get into nasty event loops and it gets very hard to debug. One thing publishes an event, it goes to another object, which in turn publishes its own events, and it ends up kind of coming back around to the original event, which ends up creating more events and on and on and on. And then, you know, you've got a, a serious problem where you're ending up adding in booleans to check whether you're emitting events and it just gets hairy. So there's a couple of solves for this. One is don't use the same message bus for everything. Have a specific purpose for each message bus. And then to, you know, keep these systems localized. You know, if you're on the client, you've got a button and it's an emitting an event, that's good. That's all you need. You don't need to go beyond that. So again, as with all of these patterns, use them judiciously, but use them because most people understand those systems when they see them. Well, I hope you liked this quick tour of five types of design patterns. There are, I think, almost, wow, 20 or so different design patterns in this book. This is a fantastic book. It should be on every developer's bookshelf. If you have any questions or comments, be sure to put those in the comments section down below. If you like the video, hit that like button, let everybody know. If you really like the video, Give Brad a subscribe or jump over to my channel and give me a subscribe. I'd appreciate it. Have a great day. Be happy, be healthy, and be safe.